Well, good morning. evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another fantastic Yankee Air Museum history historic presentation night. I'm Jeff Bush, your host for the evening. Before we begin, I want to bring up Tom Carroll, the volunteer coordinator for the Yankee Air Museum. Good evening. My name is Tom Carroll. I'm the volunteer coordinator here at Yankee. And um, once a month, I have what's called a volunteer meet and greet. And what I do is I invite in people that have expressed an interest in volunteering, get to meet them, learn about their background, talk about the open positions we're trying to fill, and I coordinate. That's what a volunteer coordinator is supposed to do, try to find a match. Now, as you can imagine, the majority of these people are, I don't want to say old guys like me, um, nor do I like the word ancient or prehistoric. Um, I, I go to the word vintage. They're vintage guys, okay, like me, uh, and like Jeff. Um, so what happens is most of the people that come in are guys that have just retired, okay? They've gone home from retirement. Their wife has presented them the honey-do list. They've completely ignored it. And now three months later, they're sitting in the executive conference room of the Yankee Air Museum. So I always start by just looking around, smiling, and I said, let me guess. Your wife has said to you, I married you for better or for worse, but not for lunch. <laughs> and they all nod their head and say yes. So all that is to say is that volunteering here is a very fun and rewarding experience. We all enjoy it, but more than anything, it's the thought to know that what we do here is important. We keep stories alive. If any of you would like to learn more about volunteering, please come see me after the presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you. As a quick postscript, Yankee Air Museum is probably the largest volunteer organization in the county, the tri-state, tri-state, tri-county area. We have hundreds who come out to volunteer for the air shows. How many non-members do we have here tonight? Don't be afraid. Oh, okay, there you go. All right. Did you know that these events are free for members? These events are free for members. So if you, as a non-member, were to purchase a $65 individual annual membership and come to 10 of these programs, costing $10 a piece as a non-member, you would put $35 in your pocket. How can you beat that? <laughs> Becca will take your membership application at the end of the show. <laughs> and also that doesn't include all the other member benefits. There are many, many member benefits that come along with the membership. Um, as always, for the members, we do ask that you donate a small stipend on your way out to help us continue to present these fabulous programs that we do every month. First Wednesday of every month, 10 to 11 months a year, we have these programs. And it does cost us money. So for a donation of $5, each member here tonight will allow us to continue bringing these exciting speakers from all over the country. And of course, I say that before we hear tonight's speaker. But, uh, <laughs> uh, some upcoming events, May 7th. We're going to have our fifth annual Bombers, Berries, and Brews, and we're adding another B this year, that being booze. We're adding distilleries and spirits this year. Uh, this is a wine, beer, and spirit test, a taste test, tasting fest. Uh, it will be, as in the past, at the... the hangars on the west side of the airport where we keep our flyables, it will be amongst the bombers and the transports and the tri-motors and the Huey. June 8th, we're going to have our second Wild Wednesday. This will feature the Canadian Snowbirds and the CF-18 demonstration team. Tickets are now on sale on the website. We had our first one about Six years ago, I think it was our 35th year. This is our 41st year. Um, turnout was phenomenal. The show was amazing. The snowbirds know how to do it right. They do a show like the angels and the thunderbirds, 
but they do it slow so you can watch them change formation <laughs> until unless you know instead of them going five to ten miles away to do it they come across the, the airport at another formation uh, June 12th wings and wheels I don't know which one this is is what fourth third fourth fifth I've been fourth maybe yeah wings and wheels we hope to do that at our new aeronautics center which is at the uh, south end of our east ramp on this side of the airport. We may not have a lot of airplanes there because we're not going to have a taxiway, thank you, County of Wayne. <coughs> but you can check our website, yankeeairmuseum.org slash events for more information. And now I would like to ask everybody to turn all your cell phones to either stun or off. <laughs> And please hold all your questions until after the presentation. There will be a Q&A session after. I love when the speaker checks to make sure he has his own. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, okay. okay. This month we have another fascinating program for you. Our subject for tonight is the famous Ford Trimotor. You are about to learn the history of Ford's pioneering involvement in the development and incubation of commercial aviation as we know it today. Our speaker for the evening is extremely knowledgeable on the trimotor. That is right, isn't it? Yeah. In general, and ours in particular. Please join me in welcoming Cody Welch. Jesus, it's great to see everybody. Uh, it is nice to be in a room where everybody likes airplanes. Uh, Talk about feeling at home. Um, my my background and how I got involved in these airplanes. Can can everyone hear me? Okay, in the back. Can you hear me? Okay. How I got involved in these airplanes is a it's kind of an unlikely story. Um, when I was a kid, I, I grew up at an airport, so my dad had a flying business, so it was kind of preordained that I'd be in aviation. My mother also had a travel agency downtown, and, and Kitty Corner out the back door was a, was a five and dime store. And so to kill the time after school, while she was working and I was supposed to be doing homework, I would wander over and buy a model kit and put a model kit together. And I remember buying uh, up every model, over this over two or three years, I bought up every model that they had. My heart pounded when I saw the B-17, or the jets, or, or anything else. And one day I realized I had assembled every model that Ravel and Monogram had made, except this ugly looking thing <laughs> called a Ford Trimotor. And as a kid, that's how I thought of it. Today I'm the highest time Ford Trimotor pilot in the world, and I don't know how it happened. Because I remember looking at that airplane and saying, boy, that's ugly. I'm sure glad I was born too late so I won't have to fly one of those. I was 12 growing up in a family that had a lot of airplanes, so I knew I was going to fly, but boy, I dodged the bullet. And in 1992, my friend Colin Soucy, a fellow airline pilot at Northwest, said, uh, Hey, we've got an opening. We, we're expanding the Ford Trimotor program over at EAA. Would, would you think you'd like to fly it? I said, let me think about that, yes. And, <laughs> and that's how quick. And so that was, uh, and I ended up uh, running that program over there. And, and we had two Trimotors, and we toured the United States. Uh, we did, I was telling my travel companion tonight that, that we were in 47 of 48 states on a tour and, and our airplanes flew about 42 weeks out of the year. We had two trimotors touring and and I, I left EAA uh, about two years ago and and uh, had an opportunity to get this trimotor uh, donated here at Yankee and, and uh, the leadership here said well if the airplane comes here, are you coming with it? <laughs> and I, I had to think about that, and I was ready to make a change after all those years up at EAA. And so now I, I, you know, I live 45 minutes from here. 
this sure seemed convenient to me. And uh, so I ended up up here. My love affair with a Ford Trimotor list it just it exists on many, many levels. Uh, the, the airplane and I are, are connected. Uh, it's the best way to say it. I, I have fallen in love with it. I love the history of it. I'm forever looking up what it's done, where it's been. I've made memories that are absolutely priceless uh, with these airplanes. The people I've met, the places I've gone, it's always about the people. But the, the opportunity to be a part of this airplane and to share it with a large group of nice people like you is, uh, is a real honor for me. So what I'd like to do is start out and, and, and just, I've got a PowerPoint. There are a lot of slides. Uh, I won't take a lot of time on each slide, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm going to uh, kind of talk about each slide and, and do it in a little bit of a sequence. Uh, hopefully it'll seem a little organized to you. So let's talk about the history of the airplanes. This is an important statement. The, uh, the trimotor really did birth commercial aviation. In the 1920s, this was the image of, of airplanes. We had um, a swashbuckling guy with, with a bandage on his nose and an unfiltered cigarette and flying goggles, and, and that's, the, uh, that's what aviation was. Engines were failing. Everybody knew of an airplane that landed in the backyard because the surplus engines from World War I weren't all that reliable. Well, we had a we had a public perception problem. Uh, the the airplanes uh, everybody knew they weren't reliable. Well, uh, what to do? A guy named Bill Stout was went around to the industrialists in Detroit, looking for investments in a fledgling company, the Stout Metal Airplane Company, and. He had a vision, and, and of course this is what actually happened, but Bill had a vision that the, the trimotor would actually, or, or commercial aviation I should say, would be the next frontier in mass transportation. So he went around to these industrialists and he said, I'd, I'd like to sell you a share for $1,000. You'll have no voting power and this, the stock is not redeemable but it will be used to build an industry right here in Detroit. And of course, uh, it was a very, it was a strongly entrepreneurial time. So much going on in all areas, lots of inventions, lots of things happening. So Bill approached Edsel, Henry's son, and said, I'd like you to, to invest in it. Edsel talked to, to Henry, and Henry said, let's just buy the whole company. And, <laughs> And Bill Stout said no. It wasn't long after that. And they bought a couple of shares, but it wasn't long after that they owned it. It was the Stout Metal Airplane Company division of Ford Motor Company. So there's Henry and Bill Stout. Bill Stout was a real character. I've met his uh, daughter, actually, uh, a few years ago. She came out to see the Ford. So Bill, uh, well, here's the passenger terminal that evolved. I got a little out of sequence. Shame on me. Um, here's Henry with some pilots. Anyway, here's Bill Stout. And Bill Stout had this little pot-bellied airplane. But if you notice, the wing form, the real thick cord here at the leading edge, and the corrugation, um, the tail has a little similarity, the horizontal stabilizer is very much like the later Ford Trimotors. And that had a 90 horsepower OX5 engine, open cockpit, but that was the, the, the air sedan. That was the granddaddy of them all, and that's what he had to talk about with the Fords. Well, the, the lineage began, so they came up with this idea of a commercial airplane, and, the, and it had a, a 400 horsepower engine. That was the Model 2, AT, AT stands for air transport because they were building a commercial airplane. 
Ford actually used this to fly back and fly auto parts back and forth uh, to some factories. And here's Henry's vision, which I, I just think is very, very insightful. The, you know, the guys like Henry Ford and, and even uh, Bill Gates today, I suppose, or Elon Musk in our era, are visionaries. They can see the future. And that's, that's what it took to go from that swashbuckling age to, to actually c building commercial airplanes that were safe, that people would climb in and fly on. Um, it's unbelievable what Henry's vision was. And check out this. Now that is a philosophy that airplanes will help wipe out mis misunderstandings between people because they will reduce distances. That, that's, that's what a visionary can do. So anyway, Bill Stout is still with the company and they go for a reliable airplane. Why three engines? Well, harken back to that picture of the biplane in the trees. The engines were not reliable. Uh, along about that time, just a couple years after that, the famous football coach Newt Rockney passed away in an airplane uh, east of Kansas City when the laminated wood wing spar split because of the casium glue that they were using and the airplane came apart in middle flight. So we knew we had to have a metal airplane. That, that, was, that was inevitable. And a new product called Duraloom, a uh, highly corrosion resistant aluminum was coming out, but we needed three engines. So this was their first attempt. Uh, <coughs> I think we're putting it nicely to say that the airplane had aerodynamic shortcomings. It made one flight, uh, one flight, and the test pilot, a guy named Shorty Schroeder, who was actually six foot two, Shorty uh, told Henry that thing's a piece of junk, and and this airplane disappeared real quick. At that time. Uh, Bill Stout, who was chief engineer of Ford Motor Company, came in and replaced, or I'm sorry, Bill Stout, Bill Mayo came in and replaced Bill Stout. Bill Stout was sent off to run the airline for Ford, their, their, the Ford uh, intercompany airline, and Bill Mayo put together his design team and they came up with an airplane that would ultimately be the grandfather of the Ford Trimotor and the beginning of a lineage of 199 trimotors. So in a very short amount of time, after that previous airplane burned up in, the, uh, in a hangar fire, a mysterious hangar fire along with all of its records, go figure. <laughs> after that, um, this airplane was born. Uh, and that, of course, is where it all happened across from the Dearborn Inn. And as we know, Ford had a list of firsts. It was the first concrete runways in the world. It had the first passenger ter terminal in the world, the first passenger boarding area, the, uh, the first hotel built for air travelers. The Dearborn Inn was built for air travelers. And if, if you're facing the Dearborn Inn, you're standing out front and look to the right, that long skinny building was the barracks for the air crews. It's still there. And of course on the National Historic Register. Uh, and that, uh, I, and I, under, I haven't been over to Dearborn, I just learned sadly that uh, one of these buildings is gone uh, and it's uh, kind of sad news, but more, more to go. So this was the, uh, obviously down here is the Dearborn Inn. Acro right there is where the terminal building was. Airplanes had a little circle here that they travel around. And th this is, that was the main hangar. Um, it became the uh, s experimental engines lab for Ford. And of course, there's Greenfield Village and, and, uh, and the, uh, the museum. And that's the passenger terminal, better look at it.
wasn't all that big. And that's what the airport looked like in 1931. And again, Greenfield Village and the museum over here and these buildings that built the Ford Trimotor. Ford had a, a dirigible mast on the airport. Uh, and it, see if I can look at this picture. Uh, my understanding was right there. And that was based on when I, and you'll hear later why I know that. This is what the airport looked like in June of 03, and of course it has evolved. And the reason that it looked like this in June of 03 is that that was the 100th anniversary of Ford Motor Company, and yours truly had an opportunity to lead a five ship of airplanes. And we landed there and parked there for a week. We were part of the 100th anniversary celebra celebration. And so I, I had, a, uh, had a wonderful opportunity. So we landed the airplanes on this straightaway. The original hard surface runways, one was here, and of course that's the crash test where the, you know, the dummies are smashing into walls there now, but the terminal building used to be right over here and the Dearborn Inn is right there. This was a hard surface runway. So I landed and I was, I was so geeked, so focused and on my game, I landed and turned right off and parked. <laughs> I had briefed my pilot friends that were behind me in the other four airplanes that I was going to roll out here and make room for them to land and then I would follow all of them back in a daisy chain and we'd park in the predetermined place. But I ruined it for everybody because I was just, I was right on the speed, right on the numbers and I, I put it right there and stopped. And then I, then I got raspberries from my uh, fellow pilots after that. But. At any rate, the, the, this was the, uh, the test track, and, and Ford since has done a lot of upgrades to that facility. And the only thing left is a yellow X. The last time I flew over it, there was a yellow X left right at the former intersection, and hopefully they've saved a, a little marker there or done something. So may, some of you may know more about that than me. Um, and that's what it looked like. I took that picture from the cockpit of the Ford, and this was the original hard surface runway here, as was that. There's that intersection, that's the crash test facility. And then of course the buildings were over there on that side. And just off the picture was the Dearborn Inn. Uh, and that was Ford Airport. And we landed there, turned off onto the original, the nation's first concrete runway. And, and as you'll see uh, later, Edsel, uh, uh, Edsel Ford, the uh, current Edsel Ford actually met us. So what Henry brought to this, this wonderful new fledgling industry was mass production. There were scores of one-off airplanes. Everybody had a vision, but nobody had a Henry Ford. And it took Henry to birth this industry. If Henry hadn't done it, uh, I would speculate that we would still have some propeller driven airliners today. I really feel that strongly. It, he needed to be here and so the, what he inherited was a, a, an air transportation system that was brand new. We didn't even know we had an air transportation system. We had scheduled mail flights and they were dangerous. Uh, they lost a lot of pilots. Uh, we didn't know much about navigation. We, f we flew by feeling the wind with our head outside regardless of the season. Uh, we we uh, didn't really know about weather forecasting. We didn't have much in the way of navigation. We certainly didn't have runways. So the, the, the materials for building, the same story. And the materials were wood framed airplanes with fabric covering. Well, that's not going to work. <coughs> so Henry brought mass production of metal vehicles to aviation and jump started an industry. <coughs> Pardon me. This is one of the Henry's 
other famous comments. You know, if, if a lot of manufacturers of airplanes had this attitude, we'd have a safer industry. Little airplanes and big airplanes alike. <coughs> we don't have to sell you an airplane. You're going to do it our way. You're going to be trained on how to operate the airplane. Pretty visionary. This was the most elaborate, and this was the fanciest Ford. They had these little wheel skirts, we call them wheel pants, in, in closed speed rings on the cowlings. It had baggage compartments that dropped down out of the wings. It had curtains in the, in the windows. It, you know, it was a pretty nice airplane. The fascinating thing about the trimotor as we go through this genealogy is that there really weren't any two the same. Uh, they were reinventing on the production line constantly as they came up with new discoveries, new ideas. And the airplanes evolved quite quickly in their very short lifetime. There's the baggage compartment. And they gave you this option, you know, that's, they just used a wire brush and a drill press and just kept putting it down, making these little burnishing marks. <coughs> Snow skis. Thirteen airplanes went to the Army Air Corps. That picture was taken over at Selfridge uh, Air Force Base. They put them on uh, floats. I've flown that particular Ford, uh, not on floats, unfortunately, but uh, that one they uh, did, <coughs> did sea trials in the Detroit River with that one to see if maybe there was a market, another evolution. This was the final airplane in Ford's uh, development. Uh, they started out as you, as you saw with the one air sedan, the 2AT, 3AT, 4AT, and the 5AT. The 4s and the 5s were the production Ford trimotors that started all the airliners, but they were looking, uh, you know, there was a lot of competition and uh, a lot of pressure to get more people in the air. So this is a 30 seat airplane with three engines, again a trimotor. And again, it had the corrugation, and it had uh, fixed landing gear. That back tire was hydraulically operated, and so the airplane would squat so you could step right into the door without even having to go up on a step. It just, the belly would lower down. So it had some innovation, but it was slow. It was going to be slow. It never flew. It, was, it only did taxi tests. And then Henry scrapped it because Douglas and Boeing, who curiously were on the design team for the trimotor, went, went off to start their own companies. Donald Douglas and William Boeing were actually good friends. And one went to Long Beach, one went to Seattle, and the rest is history. But they had a role to play in the trimotor. Well, they came up with streamlined airplanes that were much faster. The original Douglas DC-2 Skysleeper was 180 miles per hour. That's the, you know, the, our C-47 that we have here in the museum is the, D, the DC-3, but there was a DC-2 Skysleeper that the airlines bought. That was 180 miles an hour. Ford Trimotor on a good day, on a good day is about 90 to 100. So cross country, you can see that, that cuts the time in half. So the days were numbered for that type of design with the corrugation. Uh, this airplane could not fly in icing conditions. The Douglas airplane, they put rubber boots on the leading edges of the wing and alcohol on the props and the windshield to give the airplane the, the all-weather capability. So Henry scrapped it, but there was another thing that motivated him, and that's the flivver. Uh, Henry fell in like with a young uh, employee of Ford named Harry Brooks. And Harry, and, and they came up with the flivver, and it's over in the museum. This is a replica that we brought here to be a part of that 2003 celebration. It had a three-cylinder uh, three Anzani engine, uh, and it was designed to be like a, a personal car, you could fly to work. And Harry Brooks flew the flivver back and forth to work. 
Henry was really enamored with this guy and, and very fond of him. Um, Harry was killed off the coast of Melbourne, Florida. Speculated that somebody put a toothpick, it was the airplane was sitting outside and it was raining and somebody speculated, and I don't know if this is true, I'm not sure anybody knows, put a toothpick in the vent for the, the gas tank and they never found the body, they found scraps of the airplane and he ended up in the ocean. So that plus the, the fact that there was no order book for the big guy, the 14, overnight Henry shut down and Ford Airport then was an airport until the late 40s when it really converted over to the Dearborn uh, Proving Grounds, the testing facility. And let's see, yeah, there we are. Um, that was me in the front, and this was taken from another Ford Trimotor. In fact, it's the one that was on the floats in the earlier picture. <coughs> and that was uh, June 9th of 03. Uh, and that's yours truly landing at the, uh, and this was taken by a Ford uh, company photographer. Uh, and that's a Stinson in the background up above that's he had just come back from circling the glass house. And I'm just getting ready to, uh, to touch down there. And then making the turn off on that runway. I still can't believe I landed that short, but I was geeked. Uh, and there's Edsel greeting us when we, we parked the airplanes there. Uh, there was two Ford trimotors, the Stinson trimotor, and then a, a Stinson single engine, and, uh, one of, and that was the, uh, I believe that was a Yankee airplane. In fact, I know it was. And I, I think it's possible that Ray Hunter was actually flying it. I, I don't recall exactly. But at any rate, this was Edsel's business and where we gathered. Uh, we grouped there and then flew on down. So let's talk about our airplane. Uh, our airplane is serial number 42 of the 199, and it's a model 4ATB. It started out life is November 7684. The reason it has this number, 9610, is because when the airplane was resurrected and restored a few years ago, it was, uh, and that's its history, and I, I won't bore you with all of what it did, but when it was restored, the, the guy that wanted to, to re who hired its restoration for 4.2 million. This is a fellow who sold one of the early computer companies and, and really got into collecting airplanes. Uh, when Greg commissioned it, he wanted to reenact the air show that was done with Ford Trimotors, loops and rolls, and it was really popular in the 30s. And the registration number on that airplane was 9610. The, uh, Curiously enough, the, the, the original registration number I just obtained and I've reserved it at the FAA. So this airplane is, is going to get its original registration number and now everything will be back to normal. We'll have closure and close the loop, so to speak. So at any rate, it's had a typical history. Um, uh, it, it was in Detroit for a while, uh, from 38 to 41. Uh, it was in Lansing from 37 to 38. But of course, its first flight in Dearborn then went to Buffalo, down to Dallas, back to Lansing, over to Detroit. That guy taught my mother to fly, that guy right there. Um, th the, uh, and then at Finley, and then it was sold to Island Airlines in 53. And it had a, a, a takeoff accident in 72 and the, air, the airplane was mortally wounded it, it wasn't pretty it, it was out on uh, uh, at Port Clinton Ohio uh, and it just wasn't a very well managed uh, engine failure after takeoff the airplane was sold to a guy named Al Cheney it, it ended up in Caldwell Idaho uh, Maurice Hovius was contacted by Greg Herrick to restore a Ford and Maurice went and looked at this wreck 
and brought it home. And so that's how it got restored. And I'll talk a little bit more about Maurice in a minute. Uh, he is the guru of restoring these airplanes. Anyway, um, it, it made its first flight and again, <clears throat> totally restored. 11 and a half years ago, uh, yours truly was the pilot. Uh, it was a spectacular first flight. Um, and I say that with my tongue in my cheek. Um, we, uh, we learned a lot and uh, um, I didn't kiss the ground, but I should have. Uh, Maurice and I flew it and we made a few tweaks and flew it again, but the first flight, uh, I got to 10 feet and aborted and on a little grass strip where the uh, airplane was produced. And then uh, we fixed what was wrong with it and then flew it. And then uh, it ultimately got delivered up to, uh, to Greg. And then it went to D. Winston down in Lufkin, Texas. I helped Lee or D. Uh, by acquiring the airplane. I gave him some ad advice and, and uh, then I helped him find a pilot mechanic uh, who would teach D. to fly it and look after the airplane maintenance wise. D called me a few years later and said I'd flown everybody in Lufkin, Texas. I've had my fun. I want to donate it. So uh, that's how the airplane, there's a little more to the story, but that is really how it came to be. So I told him I knew of a museum that really could use it, and that museum is really close to where the airplane was born, and that's where it needed to come. And so D flew up here. Uh, we had a meeting in this building and we cut a deal and he's real happy that, that we're going to be flying passengers with it and it's home and it's never going anywhere. So what's the history on the airplane? There's some Island Airline uh, pictures of it, uh, 7684. And this picture down here is, is back when we put the airplane together, right before its first flight. This is Maurice. The, the guy has had a love affair with restoring these airplanes. This is right after the first flight. This is moments uh, before the first flight when the, the team that built it were all together. That's the very first takeoff, or second takeoff. First one wasn't so pretty, but that, that's the second takeoff. This is the first landing on hard surface. And that's my screenshot on my computer at home. And then this is uh, two years ago when we departed Texas. That was our, this is Mr. Winston who donated, yours truly. Uh, Gene Weedy Camper, the B-17 chief pilot, and uh, a couple others. Uh, Ed Rush, who's one of our pilots and was the pilot mechanic on the airplane and has joined us. And then Gene and myself when we put it in the hangar here on the 14th of June two years ago. There she is. So where are the other 190? Where, where'd all these airplanes end up? A lot of people are curious, so we'll, we'll go through that. Greg's been a collector for a long time. So this is the first one that Maurice restored for him. Uh, and that's its first flight uh, in that window. This uh, first flight occurred in Kalamazoo. That airplane's an interesting airplane. Uh, the, uh, the story goes, and, I, and it is a true story actually, that Charles Lindbergh flew Mrs. Ford to Mexico City um, to meet with the ambassador uh, in, uh, in Mexico City. While there, the, the ambassador's daughter took the fancy of Charles Lindbergh. Um, that ambassador's name was Morrow, and hence Anne Morrow Lindbergh. So that, so their first date was in that airplane. So Amelia Earhart also flew the airplane. It has quite a, quite a and that's a very early model for, uh, 4ATB. Uh, one of the, 
the oldest airplanes in existence. Uh, it is now in the hands of a, of a collector and it doesn't fly, uh, but it was sold uh, within the last two years and has been relocated. And I think it's on the East Coast, somebody told me, but the registration is a generic registration, so I can't track it down. I've looked on the internet and I can't see any evidence that it's been flying. But at any rate, it's, it's a real historic airplane. This is the Kalamazoo Air Zoo's airplane. It's currently on static display. Uh, I've done an awful lot of flying in that airplane. Uh, it uh, was on lease to us at EAA for quite a while. It was a, an airplane that has a unique history. Uh, it was, uh, uh, let me get back to it. It's 8419. Uh, this airplane was rebuilt from wreckage of a fatal accident with U.S. Forest Service uh, uh, paratroopers, smoke jumpers, out in Montana. And the, uh, the airplane is uh, 8419 is a registration number. It's a Model 5AT, which means that it uh, has a slightly longer wingspan. The fuselage is identical, but they, they utilized the Model 5, which was an option for the airlines. This tail is a whole lot wider in span so that you could add two seats back. You shift the, the center of the weight further back in order to get stability. They had to put a bigger tail on it. The wing is three and a half feet more span, so the little airplane, the 4AT, we call them Little Ford and Big Ford, the, the 4AT has a smaller center section. So the wing is three pieces. They, they come together right there, so you get the outer part, and then you got the center section. The, f the fuel tanks are in the center section, the engines are mounted to the center section, and there are literally three locations where bolts, big, the high shear bolts, fasten that outer por portion of the wing. Uh, it's not going anywhere, it's very, very strong. But at any rate, the difference in the airplanes is essentially the center section is, is wider, so that moves the engines further out, and the horizontal stabilizer is wider span. And this came out with a 420 horsepower engine. The maximum that came out on the little, little, Air, little Ford, the 4AT, was 300 horse. They actually came out initially with 220 horsepower. This was 7584, just a coincidence in numbers. They were both Island Airlines airplanes. That airplane uh, had an accident in uh, Putin Bay, uh, a fuel starvation accident. Some people here probably remember that. A guy named Dave Martin was flying it. The airplane was was re, was repaired by the insurance company, but it became too expensive to insure, and it, it ended up getting sold. It found its way to Florida, and a collector named Kermit Weeks bought the airplane, and it got to Tamiami Airport, south of Miami, just in time for Hurricane Andrew. And a uh, a large beam on the hangar collapsed and cut the airplane in half. And that's the airplane. It's actually in a little better shape now. The fuselage is repaired. Uh, the wings are getting covered. That airplane will, is probably two years away from flying. So 7584 is going to be back in the air not too long. This is a current flying airplane. It's on lease to EAA in Oshkosh. It's one of the two that I operated uh, before I left. And this airplane is also a 5AT, the bigger Ford. The Kalamazoo airplane requires two pilots. There was a certification fluke. This airplane has a waiver to use one pilot. And so a single pilot airplane and it's currently flying. It's out on tour right now. It's currently in Florida giving passenger rides. This airplane is now in Mount Pleasant, Texas. I did the, Maurice and I did the first flight on this airplane back in, in 05. Uh, it's a 4AT and it's the most original of any Ford out there. 
The starters are the inertia starters, where you use a battery to wind up a spring on these inertia starters and then release it. The engine spins. Uh, the primers are on the outside of the airplane. The wheel assemblies are, are spokes. They're, they're, they're wire-spoked wire wheels. Um, the brakes are mechanical shoe and drum, just like an automobile. It has the original joystick, uh, or we call it a Johnson bar, but it looks like a big joystick, and it's between the two pilots, and that actuates the brakes. So you have no, if for pilots in here, or people with some awareness how this works, you have no toe brakes on your rudder pedals. So you have this big bar, so you pull it back and you get both brakes. You pull it back to the left, you get a left brake, and you push it over. Well, you need three hands. It's a little tricky. So how do you start the airplane if there's no parking brake? Well, you, you employ your right leg to press on this thing and you get it started. But, oh, by the way, you got your left foot pushing a starter button to release this inertia starter. Then you got your hand, both hands going. And if it's windy, you got one hand on the, the yoke so the controls don't get blown in the wind. Uh, it's an aerobic airplane to get it going. So. <laughs> Uh, this is an airplane, a, a 4 ATB also, and it's in the Naval Air Museum at Pensacola. If you've been there, you've seen it. I doubt that it'll ever fly again. Curiously enough, that airplane is painted in Navy colors. It was never in the Navy. <laughs> this one's at the at Kermit Weeks Fantasy of Flight Museum in Polk City, just between uh, Lakeland and, and uh, Orlando, just off of I-4. Mm -hmm. That's the movie that was in the uh, Indiana Jones movie where you saw it, or the airplane that was in the Indiana Jones movie, where you saw it disappear over a cliff. That's the one. That's the, uh, the one that was on the floats, uh, the 414 Hotel. Uh, its owner that bought it, uh, was enjoying it, was tragically killed, and the estate just sold the airplane. It's now in Northern California. It's a very original 5AT, and that, that airplane's, that stripe on it is when it was flying for Scenic Airlines in Las Vegas. This is the airplane hanging in the Smithsonian down on the mall in Washington. Uh, it was donated by American Airlines. They did a tour, a commemorative tour, and the last stop was Washington, and it will never fly again. Uh, same with this airplane, it's hanging in the San Diego Museum of Flight. If you ever ride into San Diego on an airliner and sit on the right hand side, look out the window and you'll see the airplane if you look through that glass dome. It'll be on your right side. It was a former uh, Pan Am airplane. It was uh, also owned by Scenic Airlines, Grand Canyon Airlines in Las Vegas and uh, was restored to fly, but the museum made a decision not to fly it and they just hung it from wires. So kind of a sad deal. I, airplanes are meant to fly. Uh, this Ford is in Papua New Guinea. It was there. Uh, it's been sitting like that since World War II. Uh, I don't think anybody has gone down to capture it. It's also a Model 5. I can tell by the diameter of the engines. The engines are quite a uh, large diameter, so that's the bigger horsepower Pratt & Whitney. This is the one here in, uh, at the Henry Ford Museum, or the Henry Ford as it were. And this, uh, this is that airplane that was a one-off, and it was designed to fly over the South Pole. And this is the one that Bird used, and, and of course there's a real nice write-up about it there at the museum. They used a very unusual alloy It was to make the airplane light. There was no wiring in the airplane. They had one really big engine in the front and then two smaller ones on the side. And there's a, there's a painting in the men's room at the Air Zoo in Kalamazoo that shows that airplane flying over high terrain in Antarctica with the stores, the, the baggage, the freight that was on it for them to survive, they're having to throw it overboard in order to get enough 
lift to get out, get up over the hills in Antarctica. This was not a Ford, but when, when uh, Bill Stout was older, Henry Ford gave Bill the rights to build the trimotor airplane, just gave it to him. So Bill started a company, he was in his 70s or 80s at the time, he started a company and they built two Bushmasters. So it obviously has some family resemblance, but it, it doesn't, you know, they, it's so much different that the guys that have flown, I've never flown it, say that it, it really doesn't fly very well. It, they built two, they had, I remember in the 60s when they were marketing the airplane, one was built in 67, the other was built in 85. One of them was lost in an awful accident a few years ago. Let's look at a, a uh, I'm going to take, uh, n no one wants a break, right? I'll go speeding through the systems discussion right now. We, we good? Yeah. We're good. Um, so again, the production line, notice the, the construction technique. A really simple panel. We've got Model T uh, control wheels. This is a, uh, an airplane with the Johnson bar. So that bar right there is your brake handle with a little black knob on it. And the rudder pedals, or rudder bars, they don't have any brakes. Throttles, the magnetos, and these are the mixture controls here. Carburetor heats in a different location. No, just basic flight instruments. And this is our airplane before we converted and took the Johnson bar. When we brought the airplane back from Texas, it still had that Johnson bar, this thing. But since there were two of us in the cockpit at all, any takeoff and landing, you got the brakes, I'll fly it. You, you use both hands on those brakes. I'll tell you which brake to give me. You know, we, we just made it a tag team, so. It's just not as efficient. It was great back then. Back in the day that this airplane was built, there were no runways. The first concrete runway in the world was here in Dearborn. So what did you have to take off and land on? You had fields, literally grass fields. And a lot of them were just square fields. You could land into the wind. You didn't really have to worry about directional control. You just land into the wind. If you look at any Rand McNally Atlas, you'll see the term airfield, and you'll hear that used still to this day, airfield. And the, the genesis of that is that it was a field for airplanes, airfield. Um, so we didn't have to worry about these little skinny ribbons. You know, today, runways for, for big airliners are 150 feet wide. If you're lucky, they're 200. That's not much. Now when the wingspan of some of the airplanes are 200 feet. So you need precise control. We didn't have that back then. But the genius of the development of the Ford Trimotor was that you got the all metal, so people say, yeah, I, I'm more comfortable. It's metal surrounding me. You got three engines. You got an airplane that's so slow that its shadow overtakes it. <laughs> But the, but the compensating part of that is that it takes off and lands in a short space off of these fields. So the airport development in our country started as a result of entrepreneurs like Henry Ford filling airlines with these new airplanes that could take off and land on their existing facilities. Idlewild Airport in, in New York and Chicago O'Hare was called the Orchards. Uh, the, this, these were just fields. And, and so it worked great back then. So today to operate a ride program here at Yankee, we've got to be able to manipulate the brakes with a little more precision than just land straight ahead into the wind. We don't have that option. And actually, the only time you really need the brakes on this airplane, you know, some people say it's just for stopping. Frankly, it's making all these 90 degree turns just to get to the runway. That's the hardest part of flying something with one of the, uh, the hand brakes. The main landing gear is really simple. Um, Ford uses a system 
in, in this housing here is a stack of rubber donuts. Now some of the airplanes, and ours has been converted to an oil strut, like uh, an air oil strut. But initially they came out with a, just a stack of rubber donuts and, and actually did a really good job of dampening it. I don't even know why we went to the oil strut. I think it was just because everybody else is doing it, let's do it. <clears throat> and that's, that's what one of the air, air oil struts looks like, you know, a combination of oil and air and, and, a, and a cylinder inside to absorb, absorb the load. We're looking at the tailwheel assembly there, and there's an example of the, the stacked rubber donuts and the corrugation. I want to talk about the corrugation for a minute. The, the, the airplane is corrugated because Bill Stout went to Germany and, and saw an airplane, a designer named uh, Otto, I think it was Otto Junkers, who built this gorgeous little airplane that looked that would fit in today. It, it was really modern in 1915. And it was corrugated aluminum. And the idea for the corrugation was no more complicated than the reason you use it for cardboard boxes. Lighter, stronger. Unfortunately, if you take a sheet of aluminum and you shove it into the big 100 ton presses and you stamp out these ribs, these corrugations, when you get all done, that sheet's a third smaller. Well, if you're using thinner metal, you just wiped out the advantage. So the corrugation is strong, but a pregnant mosquito will dent it because it's thin. So it's, it's just, it didn't find its place. There were about four manufacturers in the United States, one Hamilton and then a couple other one-offs that tried it. The manufacturing is very, very labor intensive compared, you could build a $70 million Gulfstream jet with its smooth surfaces in one-tenth the time of an old Ford trimotor because this is all labor. It's 80 to 100,000 man hours to build one of these. And there's the wheels and brakes that we have today, uh, and their hydraulic brake. Uh, we have the air oil struts. There's what the inside of the wing. I want to show you what that looks like. So it's a series of bridge trusses. It is really overbuilt. Uh, in our my previous museum, we had original metal, and we started getting some fatigue, which led us to a decision to. Uh, to limit the use on the wing and then ultimately pull it out of service because we were getting cracks in, in the, uh, the wing spars. There's multiple wing spars in here. We never knew it. You'd find it on an inspection. Here's a, a spar that's cracked, but there's so much redundancy, you could crack several of them before you'd have any issue. A again, it was the manufacturing technique that was available the airplane, by today's standards, is ridiculously overbuilt, but we just didn't know. And so here's a sample, and we're looking up inside at the spars, and you can see every assembly, these gussets, these, these uh, uh, spar structures, these trusses, and more gussets, rivets. Imagine that, I don't know how many tens of thousands of rivets are in the airplane. It's huge. And there's a, a system of the controls. You know, one of the things people notice is that the controls for the elevator and the rudder are actually located outside the airplane. They're, they're, they're by each pilot's leg just outside the, the skin. And that's, that was a practical thing. Um, there's some really cool things about it. Uh, for example, the elevator, which is that, that elevator horn there, that's connected right to that yoke, and the yoke moves forward and ba back, and it actuates that horn, and it moves that cable on the top, that cable on the bottom, and they're bust back here, and then they connect to the, to the elevator horn back here, and that moves the elevator up and down. Well, since there's one on each side, you have redundancy. If you broke a cable, or lost a pulley or something, 
and you couldn't operate that side, the other side would work just fine and the two elevators are connected. Well, today, airliners are made requiring that you have that kind of redundancy and that is inherited from the Ford trimotor. So that's what the, the, the wheel looks like and this big assembly and then the, the horns that go to the elevators and then the other one goes to the, the other cable goes to the rudder and operates the rudder left and right and the ailerons run up through behind each pilot to a series of pulleys and then they ultimately go out and operate the, the, uh, the ailerons up and down. So it's a pretty simple system. Uh, there's the, uh, the outside of the airplane with, with the, uh, the, the, in this case, the elevator, and this little guy is the rudder. Okay, enough said, keep going. Ailerons, same story. I'll, I'll let you folks in on a little secret so that when you see this airplane over at the, the New Aviation Center over at the other hangar, or you get a chance to go fly in it, and if you have a chance to walk around, I'll give you a, I'll give you a guarantee to win a bet. And you can put whatever consideration on that that you want, but I'm going to give you a little secret. That corrugation, people will notice that on the leading edge of the wing, I, I don't know if I have a picture here, but the leading edge of the wing outboard, um, there's one shiny area, and it's about about that long and it starts out at the wing tip and it moves in. The rest of the leading edge is corrugation beautifully formed. And so, you know, I, I won't tell somebody who I am and I'll just walk up and I say, gee, mister, I wonder what that's for. And then I'll hear every kind of answer. You won't believe the answers I've heard. It, and it's a simple one and here's the secret and you're gonna win a beer on this one. The reason it's smooth is that you just can't, you can't corrugate the metal and get it to turn in that small radius because the wing gets really small as it gets out to the end. So it wasn't for aerodynamic reasons. It wasn't to enhance the stall properties of the airplane. It was manufacturing, but don't tell them. Just let them, <laughs> let them go hunt. Okay, we're, we're in the cockpit looking at the stabilizer trim. The entire stabilizer moves on this airplane, so the whole horizontal stabilizer moves. So when you trim it on this handle up above here, you're running a jack screw that is connected to the trailing edge in the center of the, of the, the whole horizontal stabilizer in the, in the back. And it's connected through, there's a large steel shaft that runs the full length so the trim that when you turn it, and this is just for the, for the gear heads in here, when you turn this crank, you get that bicycle chain, runs over and drives that sprocket, and then that shaft starts right there and it goes all the way back. And you can't see it, it's, it's up hidden above the roof panel. And then that is connected to another gear, goes down and ultimately comes up and drives a jack screw that runs the back of the horizontal stabilizer up and down and it's hinged at the front. It's the simplest system. Where you've seen this before is on a Piper Cub. Works the same way. And, and if you go out and get on an, uh, an Airbus, an A320, A321, A330, the entire horizontal stabilizer trims. Thank you Ford Trimotor. There's the engine in our airplane, just a standard Ford uh, uh, R985. It's a retrofit to the airplane. It came with of smaller horsepower, but 985s, are, while they're not a dime a dozen, they're an easy supply. We can support the 985s for a very long time, and there's still people that overhaul them. Not so with some of the other engines. Uh, oil tanks and so on, I'll just go through these quickly. Fuel tanks are actually <coughs> suspended uh, from the truss system in the center section by these straps. So that's a, it turns out to be a pre-flight item for pilots in case one of those breaks. But these are the tanks, welded aluminum. Uh, and some of this information I've used to train our pilots, so 
uh, I'll go through the areas that won't be of general interest here. Fuel drains, um, fuel sump, fuel valves, uh, a description of how our fuel valves work, and, and this is, you can see how we, we use this for ground school tra training the pilots. That just shows the valve in a tank off position. This shows the, the running position for the, so with the valve in the running position, how it gets to the, each carburetor. And uh, Ford had a very ingenious design for the uh, fuel system. They connected three tanks, and our airplane actually has three equal size tanks, just under 100 gallons each. And, and this is a, from a 4AT, but it's, a, it's the same kind of a system. The tanks are connected through a common manifold. So the fuel actually doesn't go straight to the engine. It goes into this common manifold. So any one tank by itself can feed all three engines or one engine or two engines. It's, it was a really interesting design. And, and I, hats off to the engineers who thought about that. We're having a dickens of a time trying to find those valves that were in, in uh, you know, plentiful. We have found a company that still makes new valves, four position valves, and we're in the process of getting those secured. Um, engine primers on our airplane are currently outside, so you prime it on the outside, run inside, and start the engine. But fortunately, you only have to do that once a day because after the engines are warm, you really don't need the outside prime. Electrical system is simple. Uh, one alternator, uh, and I'll just keep going around it. Here's a, interesting slides. Again, there's the, uh, we're doing the pre-flight now, and this is stuff I've shared with the pilots, a, uh, the wheels and brakes. You can see the corrugation. Uh, the, these engines and the landing gear are all mounted on a same uh, truss, welded truss structure of 4130 uh, alloy steel, and and that's uh, a real robust system. But we check the bolts, just part of the pre-flight. They're always good, but we check them anyway. And oil tank, exhaust there. I try to speed through a little bit here. It's nice shiny metal. <laughs> I hope we can keep it that way. Polishing corrugation when you've got that much surface area you think the b-17 is some, something it's nothing <laughs> this this is work uh, so most people with four tri-motors ultimately paint them silver because <laughs> it, it a it protects the aluminum we have our aluminum's almost brand new so that's that's not a real risk at this juncture but <laughs> maintain maintaining it is really an issue very simple airplane. Um, there's a, our fuel caps on the top, and I'm just flipping through it. Um, and again, that's the inside of the fuselage. We keep our ladder back there and when we're traveling, but you can see it just looks like a bridge system. Uh, you wouldn't see that today. You'd see the monocoque fuselage, typically round with with stringers and ribs, and and it. This uh, this is really strong. It won't take a falling hangar beam, but it'll take anything else. So flying the airplane, SOPs are standard operating procedures. Um, I'll just give you a little bit quick. Uh, I use this this presentation to teach our pilots, but some people know that what the term stall means, of course, and. <coughs> Power off stall is 64 miles per hour, not knots, but actual miles per hour. So in knots, that's 15% less. Uh, if you have the power on, it's all the way down to 56. If you lose an engine, an outboard engine, then 63 miles per hour, you can still maintain the airplane. You have rudder authority, even though you've got asymmetrical power with one engine idled. That these are just outstanding numbers. So, <clears throat> and those are speeds for that pilots memorize for uh, for different configurations. Here's an important one: 144 miles an hour. I've never seen that in a Ford. Um, 
if the nose is down and you're wide open, it just starts to shake. It does not like it. And so they are very slow. Uh, I have actually seen automobiles go right on by me if I'm in a headwind many times. And if you're on a long cross country, say you're going to go 300 miles and you're down to 50 miles an hour and you know the cars are going to get there ahead of you, you're going to have to stop for fuel. And so it's, it is slow. One day I got 160 miles an hour out of it with a tailwind. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. That was just awesome. So, uh, cross country operations and short field. The airplane, uh, actually we can't feather the propellers. You know, feathering means changing the blade angle. The B-17, C-47, B-25, you can change the blade angle from something that looks like this if you're looking forward to this. It gives it a minimum drag situation. It makes all the difference in the world if you're going to stay in the air if you, if you have to shut an engine down. And with these old engines, it's not uncommon to shut an engine down. The Ford doesn't seem to matter. It goes so slow, the props won't even turn. It's the rotation that causes the drag. Uh, I've lost engines at the most critical point in the flight. <coughs> Non-event. Non-event. So we are very, very blessed to have a, uh, an airplane with engine out capability that, that is very safe. You know, the, the third engine is a big deal, a real big deal. Um, okay. Is there a chance, did I hear that the Kalamazoo plane you can do that with though? Is mm -hmm. it better? Yeah. 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 yeah, she was asking if there's a Ford out there that you can feather the prop. There's one, and Kalamazoo built theirs that way. I wish they hadn't. It just made it really heavy. Okay, moving right along. Um, seats. So we got, there are nine passenger seats in the back. Uh, I'm going to do some weight and balance configurations. We're not going to be carrying nine at one time, uh, probably in the vicinity of seven, maybe eight, but likely seven for most of our flights. It's a single pilot airplane. The first year of flying uh, this year, we hope it'll be flying this summer. The, uh, the first year, we're going to be doing a lot of crew training, so we're not going to be selling the co-pilot seat very often. But once we've got a full complement of pilots up and running, the co-pilot seat will be available. It'll be a little more pricey, but it gives you an opportunity to really go back in time. Not that the back end isn't a trip back in time, but the, the, fronts, the window seat up front is uh, priceless. Um, we land the airplane on hard surface in a kind of a level attitude called a wheel landing and then slowly allow the tail to settle to assume its, its ground operation, operating attitude. On grass, we can actually land it with the tail a little lower. Um, so I talk with my pilots about what happens if the engine fails on takeoff. Um, the interesting thing on the Ford, they didn't put the ability to trim out the rudder so that if you have an engine failure across country, it's, you know, flying rides, it's never an issue because you're not going to have much exposure in terms of time. But if you're going to cross Lake Michigan or any other large body or Lake Erie, large body of water, you have to think about it. Because if you have a failure of an outboard engine, and, and I don't mean to say engines fail very often, it, it's not really that common, but if you picked the short straw and got that one in thousands of a chance that day, you got to use your foot to compensate for the asymmetrical thrust. You know, you got nice symmetrical thrust this way. You, it's like putting a brake on a tractor, it wants to go that way. You can't fly like that, it, it mushes along, so you have to push on the rudder and keep it going straight. Well, this airplane, most airplanes, you can trim that out. You know, you can apply pressure to hold the rudder. You can't do that on a Ford, so the trim is one thigh muscle. And, and, it, and uh, having been there and done that, I've got about five minutes and then the leg starts to shake and you just can't hold it. Uh, so we don't take it across large bodies of water or, or uh, 
mountain ranges unless we have the ability to drift down. We're, so we, we have to be a little careful. They never thought of these things back when they designed it. If Had they put rudder trim in, it would have made a huge difference in these airplanes. But So, you know, it's an antique airplane. It's safe. We just, we just take it into the planning. <coughs> the rudder is, you know, taxiing us kind of, like I said earlier, we really only use the brakes to make 90 degree turns. And there's why we fly a Ford trimotor. There's a little little guy there with a uh, model airplane staring at uh, staring at our arrival at a little airport in Ohio. And somebody captured this picture, and uh, it's a uh, it's just a special thing to be a part of this airplane. Folks come out from everywhere. We've we've uh, I'm wrapping up, so I'll be able to take questions here just momentarily. Um, the uh, folks come out and see this airplane, and we hear stories. Uh, I, I, I had a, a, a lady over, over the age of 100 in Naples a few years ago, and she came out and just had to see the airplane, and she told a story. She was on the original TAT flight that in 1928, uh, actually it was in, yeah, 28, yeah, June, the first scheduled airline flight cross-country was in a Ford Trimotor. Two Ford Trimotors left at the exact same time. The city of Wichita and the city of Columbus were painted on the side. And they gathered at the airport in Columbus and headed west. And it was just puddle jumping. Indianapolis, St. Louis, Kansas City, um, down toward Oklahoma, went to a little place called Waynoka, Oklahoma, out in the middle of nowhere. It was built as a as a stop for the Ford Trimotor that happened to have a railroad track next to it. So TAT, the first transcontinental airline, was a combination of trains and Ford Trimotors. And so westbound that Columbus group actually arrived there on an overnight sleeper train from New York City. So they left Grand Central Station in the evening, had dinner, and slept on the train, got up, and across the tracks in Columbus, and by the way, they're just restoring that terminal. They just got the funding to restore that airline terminal on the southeast corner of the big airline airport at Columbus where this all started. So that terminal is being preserved. And across the street, if you look on Google Earth, you'll see the railroad tracks. So you, you, you were just feet from the terminal building. So you got up in the morning and you walked across, or they took you in a little vehicle of some type, to the terminal building. You got on a Ford Trimotor and began that long trip. And when you got to Winslow or one other city out there in Arizona, it was time for another Ford Trimotor. So in Waynoka, you got off the airplane, got on a train, and then you went out to Winslow, or I can't remember the other city. And and you got up in the morning, got on a Trimotor, and on the two and a half days, coast to coast is what it took. But it proved that the airplane could do it. And so shortly after that, you know, in terms of a year or two, Douglas and Boeing started having the airplanes that could actually make it a lot quicker. You didn't need to use the train. But at any rate, in June of that year, the Trimotor inaugurated uh, cross-country flight. So in so many respects, uh, it's the birthplace. Uh, as I said earlier, I was an airline pilot. And so many, t you know, when you're landing on to the south at Metro on, on two twos or two one, the, the four runways that go south. There's four now. When I started my career, there were two runways there. But th when you're landing to the south, you actually go by the Dearborn Proving Ground. And I used to say to my, my co-pilots, hey, do you know what that is? Yeah, it looks like a car track. <laughs> I said, you, uh, you ought to be bowing down because that's where you're that what you take for granted today, that's where it all started, right there. So we are so happy to have a Ford Trimotor back in Dearborn vicinity uh, to, 
to where it all started. And I am so looking forward to the next few years of sharing this airplane with this community and helping, as Jeff said when he started, helping to remember the past and to celebrate the past and, and, and this incredible contribution that Ford Motor Company made to birth an entire industry. And, and I mean that. I've talked to people, when I say this, there's always somebody in the room said, what about that little airline that started at St. Petersburg and flew across the bay to Tampa before the Ford? That wasn't a real airline, it was a float plane, you know, that, that went between two Florida cities. Uh, this was an airline, and so I'll give them that, but really, this is the airplane that birthed the industry. That little float plane didn't have anything to do with it. So, questions. Got one here. Two questions. First part, uh, did they glean any experience or applications from building and transfer to the bomber plant? I, I don't know. Uh, we've been blessed to have a guy retired from Ford, uh, Tim O'Callaghan, who's written three books on Ford's role in aviation. Um, that would be a question for Tim. Uh, he was here at one of these programs last year. Tim, uh, Tim would know that. I think that the mass production of airplanes, certainly what they learned about that material usage you know, welding and riveting and all that, that had to transfer. The second part of the question, why one year sick of hearing, when will we fly? Uh, that's a really good question. <laughs> and I don't want my nose to grow like Pinocchio. So I'll, I'll be, I'm going to couch this. We converted the brakes on the airplane to tow brakes. We're still working through that. The system's installed. Uh, we had an engine that was making good oil pressure, but not, it was totally usable. But we thought that it would reduce our operating life on the engine since the airplane was down. Well, that engine took, took a lot more time last year. It just got stuck in a line behind a bunch of other jobs ahead of it at the shop. That cost us a delay. Um, in the next two days, the, the new avionics package for the airplane will arrive from a from a vendor over in Grand Rapids that built up the wiring harness and that'll get installed. So we've got a lot of little jobs. Uh, they've made it a priority to fly the airplane. We put a target date of April 15th with a must fly date by May 1, but those are placeholders on a calendar. Is that gonna work? I don't know. Um, do I think it's gonna fly this summer? Absolutely. I, I just don't want to get pinned down to a date. I think all of you will get an opportunity to fly in it, uh, certainly before snowfall at 22. Uh, I, I f I'm comfortable making that commitment, but I'm not going f any further out on that creaky limb. <laughs> it, two more questions, Jeff? Keep going. Okay. Yeah. Uh, who, who's? Y yes, sir. Yeah, about the engines. Uh, yeah. You said how re unreliable the engines were, so they must have did some study as to what engine manufacturer they would select as a reliable engine. Mm -hmm. And then about horsepower, you mentioned 400, 400 horsepower, but you also mentioned that the two inches and the other on the wings, or separate from the nose, uh, they were less horsepower? Yeah, if you bought one, if you're an airline and you bought a Ford Trimotor, you got three equal engines. Because you, you didn't want to have to carry two engines in inventory, you know, if one would work. So that was the reason. Airlines still do that to this day. They want the same parts so they don't have to inventory twice as many things. The airplane that's in the museum at the Henry Ford was a one-off where they put a great big engine in the center and, and the two configure, two, that was a one-of-a-kind airplane. That's not the production airplane. Okay. But how they... Who was beginning to make these engines? Okay. Yeah, so the manufacturer of the engines was a question. Uh, the Wright uh, was in the business, which was an outgrowth of Wright Brothers, you know, uh, Curtis Wright. Um, Pratt and Whitney uh, were the primary ones. Um, this airplane had, had Wrights and Pratt and Whitney engines when it was made. Two different options. The 5AT had a Pratt & Whitney 
and the 4AT had a had a right a right J6. Okay, there were others over here. Yeah, this uh, the two different, the five and the four. Were the seating capacities different? I know you, the nine you showed, which was for which. Yeah, on the maximum seating capacity on the five, if you jammed them in there like sardines, was 15 people. 15. Uh, but they were really packed in. Uh, the four uh, maximum capacity was 11. But that's just, that's like a modern day spirit airliner. You know, <laughs> they're, they're crammed in. Yeah. Uh, there were a bunch of others. The gentleman there. Real quick question. I've heard an awful lot about the safety of the Ford Tri-Motor. I wonder if you could comment on that. How safe an airplane was it? Oh, it's a really safe airplane. Unfortunately, when it came out, there were a lot of accidents. I don't know how many of the hulls were lost. I could get you that information. I'm going to say maybe up to a third were lost by in accidents. And it's because we didn't know anything about flying airplanes. It was brand new. We didn't know about how to... How to uh, uh, the things we know today about how to fly an airplane with with engines that fail at different phases in the flight. We didn't know a lot about crosswind operations because we were used to landing in the wind. We didn't know about you know cr flying across the mountains. How is the weather different there? So these things were all, this was the pioneering stuff. So the airplane's record in the early days wasn't a stellar record, but these were the. This was the first. This was. These were pioneers, and and so, today, you know, I've been flying them for uh, thirty years, and you know, and I, I've just not flown many airplanes that I felt as comfortable in. The, you know, the Douglas DC nine is the next most. You know, that airplane was bulletproof. This this uh, this Ford tri motor lands and take off takes off slow. It's very forgiving. Now it's demanding. Antique airplanes have some flying quirks and anomalies that 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 current production airplanes don't have that they've engineered out in the in the aerodin the aerodynamics of engineered out. But the 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 fact that it has three motors. It has a very straightforward flying characteristics. Um, we don't push the airplane in the weather conditions that they did all night, icing conditions, poor ceilings. You know, we fly this airplane in pretty sterile conditions compared to what they did back then. We, we are careful about the wind, we're careful about the ceiling and the visibility. Uh, it's if there's any threatening uh, cumulus, you know, thunderstorms in the area, we run for cover and put it in a hangar because it's it has so much lift, it'll blow away before any other airplane on the ramp. Uh, just it's just lift incorporated. It's unbelievable how much lift it has. So from a safety point of view, as a longtime pilot, I can tell you that I, of 400 different makes and model airplanes I've flown, uh, this one's right at the top. It, it's competing with the Douglas DC-9. The Airbus, no thanks. But, <laughs> but the uh, <laughs> Ford Tri-Motor, uh, I have a soft spot for it because it's been really good to me. Others, in the back, there's a couple. Yeah, um, around that time, I think the uh, Germans had the uh, Hocker Tri-Flyer. Uh, it was a Junkers, JU-52. The JU-52, that was Hitler's executive airplane. Yeah, the Junkers was corrugated, but it was a bigger, low-wing tri-motor, tri a corrugated low-wing. I've actually flown formation with the Junkers. Wow. Uh, we were in Chicago to try to save MiGs Airport and bring attention to it, and so I, I got to fly with, a, with the Junkers. And I've been in the hangar with the Junkers with the two airplanes nose to, together, and we took pictures. Yunkers is a lot bigger. Uh, it has three 660 horsepower uh, Daimler engines, uh, where this is, uh, the, you know, the biggest we ever had was 450. 
it weighs, its gross weight is uh, almost double what ours is. The wingspan is 25 feet more. So this is a much bigger airplane that the Germans had. And, and there's still uh, seven of them actively, actually five actually flying in Europe right now, uh, most of them in Swiss registry. The seats in our airplane are wicker, but you won't know it because we put fabric covering over them. <laughs> and we actually have reinforced them with some flat uh, aluminum straps <laughs> so that we wouldn't be stressing. The wicker is comfortable. Uh, they are wicker. Uh, someday we'll probably put those on display in the museum, but they're safe. When the, when the airplane was remanufactured, they built the frames much stronger than the original. The original seat frames were made out of aluminum, and it was just a, a stamped out aluminum, two halves, two circular halves, long strips, and they, rev they riveted them together, and that's what the seat back was. Well, these are steel, so the seats are much stronger than they came out in our airplane. There was others back here? And all the way in the back. What's it like to fly the airplane? Is it stable? Does it smooth out? Is it twitchy? <laughs> I've been waiting for this question. <laughs> it flies like a winged Winnebago. The interesting thing about the airplane is that it's, uh, if, it's, if there's no turbulence, it's fingertip steering. If it's really gusty, it's aerobic, <laughs> and it's, a, it's, it's on a continuum. So the gustier it gets, the more you work. And, uh, you know, some cross-country flights, you just sit there with one hand, and it's just lovely. But if it's gusty, you got both going, and I got shoulders like a teenager, because, you know, <laughs> wrestling the beast on those windy days. Uh, the, rudder pre the rudder is very effective. Uh, the ailerons are, are effective. The interesting thing on the control wheel, the way that they designed it, these are just big barn doors, the ailerons. And so the wheel actually moves about 300 degrees. So if you need to get some leverage, like for example in a crosswind landing, you have to start your hand down at the bottom and follow all the way around the clock. <laughs> you know, to get, get the full deflection on the aileron. But, you know, I, I must be a dinosaur, but I, I just absolutely love flying it. Uh, it I know it's quirks, and, and it, you just expect it. We have a requirement that any new pilot on the Ford, they come to us highly qualified with all sorts of experience, but the Ford is unique. So after the initial training, the pilot normally gets 10 or 15 landings during initial training. We require, before they're, they're tuned loose, turned loose as a solo captain, 100 landings wow. so that they can see all of the little tricks that await them. And, and then uh, they won't be embarrassed. We won't have any issue. And I've done that for 28 years with pilots and it works. In, in 100 landings, you will get to see the, the whole envelope and, and we never had an incident, and that's how we're going to operate it here. Cool. Others? Right there? I have a question uh, about the seating, because a few decades ago, I flew, I rode in a Ford mm -hmm. Tribal. Mm -hmm. I like to fly. I was scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> Your love affair is my <laughs> They were Spartan. I, yes, Sometimes you sat on a box. No, we yeah. had boards along the side. Right. Yeah, no, these are very comfortable seats, and you have a picture window next to you, and you can reach over and talk to your neighbor. Some of the we have. Well, <laughs> you'll have to put in a special order ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> Others, right there. 
Um, the airplane has a single stage of supercharging, so you can maintain some manifold pressure, not much. You get an extra inch or two. So we can cruise at 10,000 feet if the pilot's not so old that he's going to pass out. But, <laughs> but no, the answer to the question is uh, it depends on the terrain and the conditions. You know, if it's smooth at 8,500 feet and you don't have that dreaded headwind, uh, let's go to 8,500 feet. Uh, but for a ride program, how about 1,000 feet above the ground? And if, if anybody says, I thought you were at 900, I'll say, prove it. Uh, but but we, we, for the ride program, it's so, the visibility is so good in this airplane. It's, you know, why go up there where, where Delta and Spirit are at? Let's, let's give people an opportunity to, to see the airplane fly the way it did in the 20s and the 30s. Other questions? Right here. What year was the first tri-motor built and the last? Time? Yeah, the question was the production lifespan of the four tri-motors, all 199 airplanes. 26 was the first flight of the, I, think, I believe it said on the slide, June of 26. 1932 was the end of the run. So that was a short run, but in that time, it start, it, Northwest Airlines started with them, Eastern Airlines started with them, United Airlines started with them, American Airlines, Pan Am. It is amazing how these carriers went out and grabbed these airplanes. TWA uh, with TAT. So it jump-started all of them, and, and you know, the right or the, Curtis came out with a a big biplane, uh, wood and fabric and metal, 30-seater, um, and that, you know, a couple airlines had a few of those. But think about it, the Douglas and Boeing airplanes came out, and what did they replace? The only reason they replaced the Ford is they had more utility. But the Ford got them the runways that they could use. The Ford got them passengers that they could use. Uh, Henry did a national air tour in the in the late 20s and early 30s to focus people's attention on actually flying in an airplane. A lot of the people that came out to the airport showed up in horse and buggy. You know, the the iron horse and, and, the, and the car were were uh, foreign to a lot of people. And so to get somebody to, to actually go out and, and take off and get in the air in one of those new fangled things, that took a Ford Motor Company's promotion, uh, their design expertise, and and the financial backing of Henry to make that happen. And, and so the production span, to your question, was short-lived. The airplanes then scattered all over the place. Several ended in the South Pacific and served in World War II in, in, the, uh, in the back areas, doing transportation duties. Uh, several were in Europe. Uh, many in South America, many of those were used to haul gold out of the mines, a lot in Central America, Mexico, and uh, some of the people barnstorming around the United States, hopping airplane rides. So they ended up, and then of course the famous uh, Lake Erie, uh, Lake Erie, the island airlines that everybody knows about, the, the school kids going from, from the islands in Lake Erie over to Putin Bay, where the schoolhouse was literally at the airport and they'd, they'd get over in the morning, go to school, and fly back on the Ford. Five minutes later, they're back home. Uh, so we, that's how they ended up scattering around. And, and to this day, as you saw, that tally of airplanes that I showed you is roughly about 15 of the 199. Uh, there are a few airplanes yet to be restored. Uh, Maurice Hovius over in Three Rivers, uh, Vicksburg area has uh, he still owns the rights to two of the airplanes, and ultimately someday, hopefully, somebody will restore those. So, other questions? Do we know if Henry Ford ever flew? Henry didn't f fly. Uh, he, he rode in an airplane twice. He hated it. Uh, routine to go train the skies and that's all. How was the uh, time 
How much faster is the tri-motor go than the trains? Oh, uh, you know, think about it from, like say, Columbus to Indianapolis. Just take that route. That was a, a two-track, dirt, muddy, ruddy road with cars doing 10 or 15 miles an hour best, probably j averaging 10 miles an hour, you know, when these Fords started doing the cross country. So compared to other con terms of conveyance, um, probably about the same as a train, but the trains were on a very rigid schedule. The Ford could operate different times of the day. Um, at the time, it was a lot faster. And the train was four days coast to coast. The train and airplane combination, unreliable as it was, as a pioneering venture, it was two and a half days. So it cut a day and a half off of going from coast to coast. Others? Well, I think that's it. I think that's it. Thank you, Cody. Appreciate it. I'm looking forward to having an airplane online. If anybody can't wait for ours to be online, I was in Fairhope, Alabama this morning and found out that on March 10th to the 13th, the EAA trimotor, which is actually Liberty Aviation's trimotor, will be giving rides. They're doing a southern tour right now. Well, again, thanks, Cody. Appreciate it. We have outstanding presentations like this on the first Wednesday of every month. April 6th, we will welcome Mr. Michael Unsworth, who will speak about the Japanese balloons in Michigan during World War II. Two of the over 9,000 balloons that were launched by the Japanese made it to Michigan. Is Sarah Lukowitz still here? Okay. What about Lori today? Lori? She had to go home? Oh, pfft. all right. I'll deal with her when I get home. <laughs> On your way out through the gift shop, be sure to wish Sarah Lukowitz a happy birthday tomorrow. All right, so please remember the donation boxes off to the side here and in the hallway are hungry. Your donation truly goes a long way. Thank you, Becca Folsom, for putting together these marvelous, informative programs. Great job, Becca. And thank you all for coming out tonight. And until next time, bye-bye and bye-bonds. See you.